Hello and welcome to today's Digital Scholar webinar. My name is Katja Reuter. Today we will spend some more time exploring scientific communication in the digital age. Um, we will look at digital strategies um, to find the right journal for publishing your research. So there are actually tens of thousands of academic journals to choose from. And as many of you probably know, um, submitting a paper to a journal that is not the right fit um, is a key cause for rejection. And the fact that we are experiencing the second journal boom in history doesn't make this any easier. So this webinar today will provide you with an overview of a number of digital tools and initiatives that help researchers select the right journal. So we hope that after today's webinar, you will be able to do three things. Understand journal selection mechanisms in the digital age. Describe a couple of novel digital tools that help you identify in the right journal and understand the role of associations in facilitating effective journal selection. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Duncan Nicholas. Duncan is a former development editor at the international academic publisher, Taylor and Francis Group. He's also director of a research publishing consultancy and senior consultant at or for Inago Academy. As always, please add your questions to the Q&A panel, which you can find on the right side of the webinar. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Duncan, the mic is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with everyone today. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I have to find my slide. OK. So I'm going to speak to you today about digital strategies to find uh, an appropriate journal to publish your research. And we've got several sections to go through today, going to give you an overview of journal selection. And then we'll get into some key ideas of how to identify suitable journals and tools and techniques that you can use to fine tune your selections. Um, I'll introduce you to the Think, Check, Submit initiative. And we'll look at some platforms and tools that are available from publishers um, and Enago themselves of how to identify suitable journals and ways to some tools and websites to how to ensure the integrity, authenticity um, and the, the rank and relative importance of journals that you might want to choose between. So we'll begin with an overview of journal selection. Now, one question uh, that it's useful to ask ourselves um, of submitting to journals is why we want to submit to journals, what is the role of journals, why is it so important um, to choose a specific journal or even publish in a journal at all um, to get our work read by other people. So <clears throat> this identifying the role of the journal and, uh, and determining the, a value of why you want to submit and publish in a journal is quite important for choosing which specific journals that you might want to submit to. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, well, any of these reasons could be interchangeable in fact, but primarily a journal is for facilitating communication between other experts and researchers in your field. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they are <clears throat> they are the primary key way of uh, disseminating research among like-minded, interested peers. Uh, and journals help to set intellectual standards um, through an, a number of ways. Partly through the selectivity of choosing which articles to publish and which to accept partly through the researchers involved in the community around the journal, the editor, the editorial boards, the wider group of authors and reviewers, they all help to set uh, academic standards um, and progress the field in certain directions. So submitting to journals and getting published in them, of course, helps us to advance our careers, um, and certain journals may or may not look good on CVs. You may be required to submit and publish in 
journals that meet certain criteria, um, and the publication of work, the visibility of you and your research, and the value that you're contributing into this community with your work. That helps you advance your career and also helps other people advance theirs through shared knowledge. So it's all uh, contributing to the community of your field. So through, through setting editorial standards um, and academic standards, uh, publishing in a journal certifies the authenticity of your research, the value, the integrity. Um, and that's kind of the stamp of quality and validity that you might be hoping to receive by publishing in a journal. So though all of those concepts and things are, uh, are useful to bear in mind when you're choosing which journal might be suitable for your work. And we'll go into some reasons why um, shortly. So <clears throat> here is a, an illustration of the whole uh, the whole reviewing kind of publishing submission process from creating research, preparing the manuscript and writing it, choosing a journal to submit to, having it peer reviewed and revising it, uh, maybe being rejected, having to select another journal, uh, and ultimately being accepted. So the focus of today's presentation is the journal selection process and identifying specific titles and giving you tools to choose appropriate journals. So, uh, as Katja mentioned in her introduction, um, the number of journals, we are in something of a journal boom for various reasons. There has been a, a huge growth in journal numbers, um, which here in the slide from 2014, we've got 28,000 active peer review journals. There was a, a, a report by the International Association of Scientific, Technical and Medical Publishers uh, that estimates the number of active journals at around 33,000 English language journals, almost 9,500 non-English language journals, which is a nearly 43,000 journals, um, active journals at the moment. Now, that's a huge number and it reduces drastically when you're talking about one specific field. So you, of course, don't have to choose between that many different journals. Um, but in any one field, there can still be a very large number. So competition from journals to attract authors is quite, quite fierce. It's quite competitive. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we'll talk about ranking journals later in some ways, why there, there are some, some benefits and merits to some form of qualitative ranking of titles to help you choose which one. Uh, and that means that as an author, it's very competitive to find, to get your paper accepted into one of those few top journals. So next to, next to this, 28,000 active journals. We also have the rise of what are known as predatory journals, deceptive journals. Uh, I like to call them shell journals because they, they are a problematic entity in the publishing kind of ecosystem landscape. Um, and they, they typically provide authors with no value at all to submit your paper, but they are uh, primarily interested in taking money from authors for open access publications. Um, and I'll talk in a little bit more detail about how to avoid those types of journals uh, later on in the presentation. Um, but this is foreshadowing uh, that information that will come later. So, some key considerations to bear in mind. So like I suggested, identifying a specific journal to submit to might be like searching for a 
needle in a haystack trying to find that one individual title that perfectly fits your paper um, out of the thousands. So one of the, well, before, before I get into kind of granular details, one thing that I would certainly recommend that you have uh, on your quest for choosing a right journal um, is to create a spreadsheet um, and you can use a Word document if you prefer. I'll, I favor Excel spreadsheets or for most of the things that I try and achieve. Um, <clears throat> So create a spreadsheet that you can capture all of this kind of information that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So for, for every journal that you look at, you can record. So we're on this slide for aims and scope. You can note some key details of each of the journals. And then you will build up a, a picture of or and a record of all journals that are relevant to you and your current research. So this is quite, uh, it can be quite time consuming to do this, but it's certainly very useful for referring back to maybe the future papers that you write, future research that you conduct, um, assuming you don't change field entirely. So you'll build up a, a list of all journals that will be suitable. And depending on the type of paper that you have, the type of research or the specific goals of your research, you can use it as an easy reference for identifying which of the journals that you've looked at that would be suitable. So we'll start with the aims and scope of a journal. Now, hopefully, when you look at a journal um, on their website, they'll have very clear, well-defined, detailed aims and scope that tell you exactly what the journal hopes to achieve, what its goal is, uh, the types of papers that it accepts and whether it is a, a general interest large journal that covers maybe lots of topics or is suitable for a wide audience or whether it's very niche and, and covers only a, a very small specific area um, the significance of the research that they accept. Some journals will state that they will only accept a very groundbreaking novel research. Um, so those journals usually have quite low acceptance rates um, and they'll reject perfectly good papers that they don't, with the only, the only difference being the ones they accept really uh, add some Pro progressive information to the field. So some journals will will state that quite explicitly in their aims and scope. And there will also be details of the types of papers. So an uh, original empirical research, case studies, review articles, uh, and also uh, paper lengths as well. Um, how many words, how many references um, that you can have in the paper, how many figures. Um, and yeah, different types of study, theoretical, applied research, um, multi-level analysis, uh, clinical laboratory research, field studies. And they should also clearly state whether they are an open access or a subscription publisher. Uh, if you or if you can choose to publish open access in your in the journal, if that is a consideration. Um, and also look at whether they charge any publication fees, page fees. Some journals will charge um, a certain amount of money for every page that your paper takes up to supplement production costs and things. So look out for these, the aims and scope, instructions for authors or about journal sections and kind of put down in your in your spreadsheet um, all of all of these kind of pertinent details that might affect your choice so um, i mentioned like niche or general interest and the scope of the journal um, so again to a bit more detail about that now so 
top tier journals like Cell, Nature, Science, The Lancet, um, they have very low acceptance rates. They might they might accept ten or five percent of submissions that they receive. So they receive thousands of articles every year and ex- and uh, reject the vast majority of them. Um, open access journals, broad scope open access journals like PLOS One. Uh, they may have higher acceptance rates um, because they are not not accepting for novelty. They are only looking for the rigor of the method to make sure that um, the research has been conducted with integrity and will be a valid piece of research that can be used by other researchers in the field. So, because they're not looking for for that novelty that those top tier journals do. They have higher acceptance rates. Um, in some respects, it's not necessarily easier to get accepted in those journals because the research still needs to be um, be sound and be written to a high standard to be accepted. Um, <clears throat> but open access journals typically charge publication fees. Uh, not all of them, but we'll get into open access specifically a bit later in the presentation. Um, then we have specialized journals. Uh, <clears throat> uh, some might be society journals. Um, some might be open for everyone. Um, they may have a very narrow focus, for example, um, to know developmental psychology of children as opposed to um, a developmental psychology in all across all species, um, those types of different focus. So that that specific information should be taken from that aims and scope as well. Um, international and regional journals as well. Um, so there's a, a couple of ways a journal might present this. Broad international journals say, well, those top tier journals are international. Plus one is an international journal. They're read by a global readership. They accept papers from anywhere in the world. They accept papers that have relevance to anywhere in the world. Um, <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, some international journals may only accept papers that have a completely global international relevance so um, <clears throat> so an article uh, with relevance to just one region may not be acceptable for some international journals so just because it has that word international in the title doesn't necessarily mean um, that they'll accept papers from anywhere about anything uh, similarly some regional journals will accept papers from anywhere in the world about anything with relevance on a global scale. They just happen to be based in a particular region and their name may reflect that purely because that's where they're based, not because that's what the research represents. And or on, the, or on the other hand, they may only accept papers from a particular region or with relevance to that region. So again, that's something else to consider. Um, additionally, um, in terms of kind of indexing, web of, web of science, uh, kind of scopus indexing, uh, regional, regional journals may not meet the indexing criteria of those databases. Um, indeed, we'll speak about the actual databases later. But for example, the Web of Science, who make impact factors, um, they have a Russian, a separate Russian index, a separate index for uh, Latin American journals that are from those regions. That's not in the main Web of Science with all the international journals. But there is a difference there as well that you might need to consider. Um, so accessibility 
of your research as well. That might be something that is or is not so important to you. Who do you want? Uh, who do you want to read your research? How broad an appeal does it have? Um, and if your if your work has a very broad public interest, then you might want it to be published open access to give it the greatest accessibility. Um, if if you feel it's you don't need it to be open access or it's only really of benefit to your specific niche of other researchers, fellow researchers, then a, then a closed access subscription journal um, might be suitable. Um, <clears throat> so if you're considering open access, um, there are different models that publishers might um, offer. So the traditional model, the subscription journal is completely closed, only available to subscribers. Gold open access um, is where the article, your article is made freely available for everyone to read, usually under a Creative Commons license. Um, so you get to keep the, the copyright and all rights to your work. That's a fully gold open access journal. Um, <clears throat> and green open access is where um, you're, you will be permitted to deposit your accepted version of your manuscript um, into a discipline or institutional repository. Uh, usually, again, under a Creative Commons license, you can do that. So that's not the publisher typeset, copy edited online version. That's the version of the paper that has been accepted. Um, and the hybrid model are subscription journals that allow open access publishing. So discoverability as well could be a key you know, related to accessibility. Discoverability, which databases is the journal indexed in? How easy will it be for people to find your work? So here we've got quite a few different databases, um, the Web of Science, Scopus, PubMed, um, Sightseer, all different directories and databases that a journal might be indexed in to make it easy for people to find your work. So make a note of those kind of, that kind of information as well. Um, social media presence as well. Uh, lots of the big publishers are quite big themselves on promoting um, certain pieces of research uh, and also encouraging um, the authors of articles to do some self-promotion as well after papers have been accepted and published. Um, obviously, if, uh, if it can be beneficial for a journal to have a social media presence and have an audience that's waiting to hear about the types of articles that they publish to help you um, disseminate your work and get it spoken about in a wider audience. So other factors of journal quality that might be important to make a note of. Um, so the aims and scope might also mention the the target audience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start at the top of this diagram and work clockwise round. So is the journal read by your target audience? Does the aims and scope say who the journal is for? Is it for the public? Is it for primary researchers? Is it for industry? Is it for uh, clinicians, nurses, caseworkers? Does it have a, a specific audience? And is that relevant for your work? Who is on the editorial board? Do you recognize any of the names? Um, if you do, then it's likely that your article is going to be suitable for that journal, possibly. If you recognize their name and their work, maybe you've even cited the work of members of the board. So that probably means that it's in the, your paper is in the right scope for that journal. Um, is, it, is it peer reviewed? Does the journal mention anything about its peer review process? Does it have open reviews where you can actually see 
um, the types of reviews that the journal receives? And does it give any indication of how long the peer review process takes? Um, some journals might explicitly present this information and tell you the number of days or weeks or months, hopefully not years, but occasionally. Uh, you can also work out, roughly work out, how long it might take for a paper to be reviewed as well. If you, lots of journals publish the, the submitted date and the accepted date of articles on their website or in the paper itself. So if you have a look at several papers from a journal and look at the submitted date and the accepted date, you can work out roughly how long it takes. Although bear in mind that time frame includes the time it takes for the authors to revise as well. Um, so is the, is the publisher clearly mentioned? Is there an address? So this is one of the telltale signs of predatory journals that I'll speak about in a bit more detail later. Um, how does the journal rank compared with other respected journals in your field? We'll speak about metrics a bit later as well. And that might be an important thing for you to consider. It might have some bearing. Um, but in terms of creating, adding information to your spreadsheet of choosing journals, that will be, any, any information is useful to add. Um, is the journal subscribed to by libraries or indexed like we were looking at in the last slide? Who reads it? Who is the built-in audience for the journal? Does it have official tags of ISSN number? Is it registered in kind of officiating databases? But does it look like a proper legitimate journal? Um, the citation metrics, do they present an impact factor? Um, do they have, so this colorful donut in the middle, um, if don't know if you are familiar with alternative metrics, alt metrics, or um, this is a, in the last six, seven years, alternative metrics have been gaining a lot of traction and increasingly over the years, more data is being added to these, to the old metric database and the sources. So the impact factor uh, and, the, and the Scopus metrics, the site score, they're, they're based on citations only, um, which is uh, an academic researcher based way of evaluating how much a paper has been used. Um, well, not even a paper, sorry. So those citation metrics are journal level metrics and they're all averages of the citation activity to a journal in the last two years or three years. And whereas alt metrics, alternative metrics, they capture um, internet based activity, usage, and reference and mentions and activity of a paper. Um, and they are immediate as well. You can immediately see in them who is discussing your work, what they're saying about it, and the context in which they're saying it. Um, <clears throat> and so there are two main ones, Altmetric and Plum Analytics. So Plum Analytics are on most Elsevier journals, uh, and th thousands of other journals use Altmetrics. Um, so, and they, they give you a very interesting view of um, the people that are interested in the work of a journal. So you can click through the old metrics and have a look to see if any websites are writing about the journal, if any blogs are picking it up, news sources. Um, so you can see who has their eyes on the content of that journal. You can look at people on Twitter. Um, or Reddit, Mendeley, that are reading and discussing your work. So you can have a, a look at the audience of a journal in a lot of detail through alt metrics. So if you see that colorful donut on the journal, click into it and have a dig around all of the data that's in there.
So our speed of publication, spoke a bit about that in the last, the last slide. So some of them might present turnaround times from submission to acceptance, some might not. Um, speed, of, speed of review might be important to you um, in submitting your paper. Um, hopefully not, because the peer review process is notoriously inconsistent, let's say. Sometimes it can work beautifully smoothly and you can get two or three really constructive reviews back within a month, maybe even two weeks from a journal, revise, resubmit in the next couple of weeks and be published within a matter of months. Other times it can genuinely take a year, over a year to go through the whole peer review process. And so really when it comes to peer review, be prepared for anything. <clears throat> The factors that might be useful for you. Uh, in the grey box, supplemental data. If you have huge, if you have supporting information useful for the paper that doesn't need to be published in the article, will the or will the journal publish it alongside as supplemental data? Do you have a funder uh, who's funded your work? Do you have to comply with any guidelines for them? Do they have requirements of the types of journals that you might need to submit to? Chiefly open access, that's usually quite a common thing that a funder might want, or on the other hand, they may want it in a, in a specific range of journals. Um, accessibility, readability on mobile devices could be important, um, depending on your research area and your audience. Does the journal comply with ethical guidelines, the Committee of Publication Ethics, COPE, look out for the green or white COPE logo or mention of that acronym. They're the kind of governing body of publication ethics that will ensure, hopefully, if the journal is following their guidelines, that they will be legitimate and following high editorial standards. Um, Okay, so uh, they are some of the sort of key key measures and key kind of pieces of information that uh, will be worth writing down into a spreadsheet to help you identify uh, which journals might be suitable gathering information for those. Um, and of course, your uh, as well as kind of browsing journals um, you can look through your reference list the journals that you the articles that you reference to inform your paper um, that's probably the the first place the best place to start looking for suitable journals so go through your list of references all the ones that have most significantly informed your work make a note of all those journals then look through there websites and gather all of that kind of information. Um, so the think so I've spoken about open access um, a couple of times. So I'm going to speak in about that to that in a little bit more detail now. And the and I mentioned predatory journals as well. So combine these two things. The think check submit initiative um, was started to confront this problem of predatory journals. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of predatory journals before. Um, so yeah, these, uh, the number of these journals has grown very rapidly in the last few years, taking advantage of the author pays open access model um, to charge authors to publish their work. Um, so, the, so you want to be choosing a journal that will give you a good service. Um, you want them to con conduct a thorough peer review process. Uh, although I was saying it takes a long time and it can be very daunting to have your work critiqued. Um, it's also almost all 
authors say that the peer review process um, significantly improved their work, fine-tuned their writing, and their articles are much better for having been peer reviewed. Now, these predatory journals typically don't perform any peer review at all. They will just accept any paper that is submitted to them because they want the money from the authors. So that's, that's one of the key problems with those types of journals. Uh, so it means that maybe we can't trust the research in those types of journals as much as ones that do conduct a thorough peer review process. Um, so the Think Check Submit initiative is designed to help avoid those types of journals. Um, and they have a, a checklist for assessing the quality of a journal based on all the types of things I've just been speaking about, um, the, the kind of integrity and editorial processes that journals have. Uh, so Think Check Submits is an initiative started by all of these organisations. There's the Committee of Publication Ethics in the middle, um, Open Access Publishers Associations. Um, and this DOAJ at the bottom, um, the Directory of Open Access Journals. And I'll get to them in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, so Think, Check, Submit asks you, first of all, to think whether a journal could be a predatory journal um, and then check on various criteria to see whether you feel that it is of high quality enough and will offer you a good enough service and get your articles read by the right community of readers. Um, so offering you a value that you need. You spend a lot of time conducting and writing your research. You don't just want to put it on a website and have no one read it. So that's one of the key important things that a good journal will do for your work is to get it to the right audience to read it. So think, check, and then, yes, if you're happy with the journal, uh, then submit to it other resources to identify the right journal. Uh, Find My Journal is a, a website which uses algorithms to give you a list of suitable journals from uh, most, oh, well, all the major publishers, Elsevier, TNF, Wiley, Springer, um, the Web of Science indexed journals, Scopus indexed journals, um, Sage publisher. So uh, it indexes yep. uh, a large number of journals. So you, you can paste your abstract and title from your work, and then it will um, check against all articles from all those other journals um, and bring you back lots of suggestions. And you can filter it for a number of other factors as well. Um, subject area and look at article types as well, whether they accept your article types, estimated turnaround times if that's important, um, journal metrics, web of science indexing, those types of things, filter it for all those. So that is findmyjournal.com. Um, that's one useful tool. So that, that looks at closed access subscription journals and and open access journals as well so everything that those publishers produce um, Inago themselves also have a um, a search a search engine based on the directory of open access journals index their list of journals um, <clears throat> So similar to Find My Journal, you can paste in the details uh, of your paper here, add your abstract, um, and then we'll look at uh, nearly 3 million articles to give you back a match of suggested journals. Um, and you can do some other uh, kind of filtering and investigating 
of which ones might be the most suitable for your paper as well. <clears throat> and there are other. So both of those, Find My Journal and the Inago one, are cross-publisher big reference databases. Um, and from them, you'll get a nice big list of journals. But there are also publisher-specific tools as well that you can use that will only search that one publisher's platform. Um, so Elsevier have had their journal finder around for a while. Springer have got one. Um, and Wiley have just started their own one as well. Um, now, the Elsevier one actually does provide turnaround times for the results in there, show you the turnaround times for the journals and the production times as well. So after your paper has been accepted, how long until it might be published in the journal properly. <clears throat> so that's, that's something quite interesting if that matters to you. Else the journals will actually tell you that. Um, excuse me. But each of, each of those is obviously limited to just the one publisher compared to those other two. Um, so all of these search engines tend to um, <clears throat> use your abstract and your title. Um, OK. So tools to ensure the authenticity of journals. So I've spoken about this. I've mentioned this word a couple of times. Um, authenticity, integrity, validity, particularly in the world of open access. Um, so the directory of open access journals um, is sev several years old now, and it is a large database of over 12,000 journals that publish open access articles um, in science, technology, engineering, medicine, as well as social sciences in humanities. And they have, together with um, the Committee on Publication Ethics and Open Access Publishers Society, they have created some quite granular, very, very fine criteria for accepting journals into their database. So <clears throat> if it's in the directory of open access journals, then it's highly likely to be a legitimate journal. Um, and they also, you are also able in there to search by um, article processing charges, whether um, whether the journals do charge any submission fees or article processing charges. Um, and there are a large number of journals in this directory that offer free, no charge, open access. Um, I think the, the average price cost for an article processing charge for open access in all of the journals indexed in this directory is about uh, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars, and I think for um, to publish in a publish as open access in a subscription journal under the hybrid model, um, the average is uh, maybe one thousand five hundred, two thousand, um, and the range of prices for article processing charges go up to. $6,000 in the big top ranked um, glamour journals like Cell and Nature. Um, so the range of prices for open access is considerable. And you can get that kind of information from direction of open access journals. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, and you can look the article level in in this directory. So if a journal is looks interesting and you want to investigate a few papers 
to see if they really do publish similar articles to yours. Um, if you search for your journal title, do any journals come up? Are there similar papers to yours? That probably means that journal is relevant for you to submit your work to. Um, so if you're looking at open access journals, make sure that it is indexed in the DOAJ in this directory. Um, because it does have quite strict acceptance criteria. And some of the journals have a special seal as well, a special little logo next to them um, to say that it's been you know, specially commendated by the directory. Um, some journals get removed um, from the directory, so it is continuously updated. Um, uh, so this acronym here, the Organization of Open Access Scholarly Publishers, um, that's a, that's an organization of, of publishers interested and invested in furthering open access. So they, they helped to write the criteria for inclusion in the directory of open access channels. Um, and if you want to have a look at their, their website there, it's oaspa.org. The Directory of Open Access Journals as well as DO is their website is doaj.org. Um, but uh, yeah, you will be sent the slides or you will have access to the slides after this presentation. Um, so if I've skipped anything too fast or you want to check anything again, then you'll be able to go back through everything at your leisure. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so metrics, other indexing databases, the, the Web of Science, Clarivate Analytics uh, indexing. Um, master Journals list, this is publicly available, the master list. Um, uh, possibly you already have access to the Web of Science or Insights through your institution anyway. Um, but if not, uh, you have the master list here and you can search to see if a journal is in there, see if it's covered. Um, uh, okay, so journal ranking. Um, Scimago as well, this is the Elsevier Scopus database, similar to the Web of Science. Um, the indexes, lots of... Um, I think how many journals? Thirty thousand journals. So lo lots of them, um, and this provides metrics, um, their own Scamago journal rank index, and a H index for journals as well, based on the citations that are recorded in the Scopus database. Um, so you can have a look at subject areas in here and in the Web of Science. Um, have a look at how they're ranked against each other. Uh, see where they are in the in the field, how they compare. Um, and you can choose journals from there as well to investigate further. And check out their aims and scope and all the other things that I spoke about at the beginning of the session. Um, so here's an image from, from the SJR. Maybe it is familiar to you. Um, yeah, you can have a browse through regions, types of journals. So here on the kind of the top left, there's only open access journals, only Sciello journals, um, or only Web of Science journals. So you can limit it to different sources here as well. Uh, and that is the end of uh, our prepared presentation. Um, and I will try to answer some of the questions that you've been sending us um, uh, very shortly. Um, so this was a presentation on behalf of Inago, who are uh, one of the world's leading language author services solutions providers with offices all over the world, um, working with uh, over 300 universities in 100 countries, um, 
helping researchers, providing workshops and webinars to help researchers publish successfully in journals, supporting universities, uh, libraries, and providing publication guidance, e-learning modules, online an online Q&A portal, webinars like this, podcasts, and in-person sessions as well. Duncan, thank you so much for this presentation. So we have a, a good number of questions here. If you don't mind, please take a look at the Q&A in the chat, and you can uh, read out loud the questions and then answer them, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, I'll see. Uh, okay. So first question, OV13, is publishing only intended for researchers only? What communities other than traditional academics, science researchers are pursuing these channels? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, obviously, people... Uh, well, from personal experience, people in the publishing industry publish in journals. I do a lot of um, writing and work looking at editorial processes. So I've published in journals and I'm not a, a researcher at an institution. Um, citizen science as well is gaining a lot of momentum um, with public contributing to uh, primary research processes, data collection, things um uh and uh i mean tangentially i don't know if uh, how many of you have twitter use twitter spend much time on what's known as academic twitter um but if you do you might you know you will meet a lot of people on there who are not um traditional formal academics but who are researching and who are involved in journal publishing and research. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, how long does it usually take for a brand new journal to get indexed and rated? Um, Web of Science, and I believe Scopus as well, like to look at three years of publishing history. Um, so it won't be until the fourth year of a journal's life that it gets reviewed for inclusion. So it's likely to be, and usually the fastest it will be, it'll be reviewed in the fourth year, maybe indexed in the following year, so the fifth year of a journal's life. Um, it can happen much faster. There are various criteria for including it in, in one of those databases. And kind of a, a unique progressive contribution or development of a field is one of those reasons. And if a journal is accepted very quickly, it's usually because of that reason, that it's some very hot uh, subject area that's developed maybe out of a multidisciplinary field and it's, there's enough demand for it, for a journal to be created in that area. So they'll add it quickly. Um, is open access journal required to charge publication fees? Uh, hopefully I covered that already with the Directory of Open Access Journal section. Um, no, it's, I, I mean, the, the publication fee and and subscription fees are, I mean, pri primarily to cover the costs of running a journal. And there can be considerable costs involved in all of the processes that it takes to um manage websites, manage the peer review process, uh, manage the whole editorial process. So there are costs involved. Um, and that may, that dictates some of the fee. Um, uh, and the journal may get funds to cover that from somewhere else, which means it doesn't have to charge the author any funds to cover the publication. So some journals don't charge anything. Uh, whereas other journals charge thousands of dollars to cover their costs and possibly a little bit of profit as well, and possibly a lot of profit. It's debatable. Um, hopefully that answers that. So where can you find statistics about the readership of certain journals by geography? 
um, the Web of Science and Scopus, you can download the data. You can download raw CSV data from the Web of Science. Um, and you can look at the geography of um, uh, the geography of citations, which will tell you something about the readership. Um, you can use alt metrics to look at where the mentions of articles are coming from around the world. Um, I'm not sure if other very open progressive journals will provide the information of where they get their website hits from around the world. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. But certainly you can look at who's citing the journal and who is giving it some attention through old metrics as a start, if that's helpful. Um, is impact factor impacted in any way by whether the journal has LinkedIn or Twitter presence? Um, this kind of links into the old metrics, alternative metrics. And there is a growing body of research that is investigating whether the immediate attention from the rest of the internet, from media, news sites, social media, whether, whether a large scale of attention there does equate statistically significantly to in, increased citations and therefore impact factor um, later on. But I mean, impact factor is at a journal scale, so it would have to be very consistent across lots of different articles to affect the impact factor. Um, you know, personally, I would just look at it at, on an article by article basis to see whether there is an effect there. And there is, there is some growing evidence that, yes, a lot of attention at the beginning does lead to increased citations later. <clears throat> um, okay, how are uh, online journal reads measured site visitors, article page visitors, downloads? I mean, how, how are they measured? That's just uh, visitors to the journal. Um, you know, Google, Google Analytics that can measure that, that kind of sort of internet traffic tracking infrastructure. That's where those come from. Um, okay, so you, uh, someone has asked, I have a niche paper. Um, oh, let, let me just uh, ask Katja, is this webinar going to cut out on an hour or can I just keep talking? No, feel free to go ahead. Um, as long as people stay on the line, so to speak, uh, we can go a little bit over time. So thank you for, for doing that. Okay, uh, so you have a niche paper that you are having a hard time finding a journal for. Um, hormone journals say it's too exercise focused and exercise journals say it's too hormone focused. Uh, any feedback? Um, perhaps, you know, a, a broader scope journal. So that, that sounds like each of those is has its own particular niche. Um, so perhaps a broader scope journal might be um, might be interest there. So so this is a, a kind of a good example of why creating a spreadsheet with lots of potential journals might be useful. So you can rank them in the order and you can make a note of the reasons why you've ordered them in that way. So your first choice would be a hormone journal. The second choice would be exercise because they are your kind of focused specific fields. Um, maybe your third choice could be a more broader journal. That's really not being an expert in predictor hormones. I can only, only give a certain amount of suggestion or information there, I'm afraid. Um, uh, but you know, a broader, a broad scope, wide interest journal there um, might be useful. Uh, hopefully, you got some reviews from those journals, though. But perhaps not. 
Um, ah, okay. Good, glad that was helpful. Um, okay. Uh, Zoe asks, is there a drawback to publishing many articles in one journal versus publishing articles in a variety of different journals? That's uh, an interesting question, um, actually. Uh, I would say, well, publishing in one journal has its kind of core audience, I would guess, and maybe a variety of journals, they have uh, perhaps overlapping audiences. So maybe they'll have a lot of same, but you might eventually uh, reach a wider audience through publishing in different journals. Um, on, on the other hand, you know, if you want to become a very uh, a valued member of a particular journal, that particular community, and there is a certain something about that journal and community. You know, perhaps it's a society journal, um, and you want to contribute to the development of that society, of that community, and then publishing in repeatedly in that one journal is, um, you know, that has those merits. Uh, but, I mean, really research, in, increasingly research is, and the goal is for research to be evaluated at the article level, not really the journal level. And I think the way people are searching for research, finding articles um, is not really based on receiving a paper journal through their letterbox every couple of months. So probably in terms of discoverability <clears throat> it doesn't really matter which journal that you publish your article in because people will find it anyway particularly if it's valuable and you're telling people about it telling relevant people about it um, and getting the word out there that you've performed this research people are citing it it will it will reach the audience that you want it to anyway regardless perhaps of the journal that it's in or the number of different journals. Hopefully that is that's a bit helpful to answering that question. But that, that is a very good question. And I'm pretty sure that's the first time anyone's ever asked me that. So after this call, I'll probably have a proper think. Now, when I'm not on the spot, I'll probably have a better, <laughs> better more informed answer for that. I can, I'll dwell on that one. That's interesting. Um, and so we, again, do articles published under a gold open access model generally gets cited more than articles published under a green open access model. Um, again, that is another very interesting, good question um, that I'm writing down to save for later. Um, there is evidence that gold open access journals are certainly read more. Um, and in some fields, they do have a citation advantage not not in others so that's a mixed mixed findings there that's for gold open access um but for green it's much harder to track how people have accessed articles in repositories and because for for gold open access journal it's um, for an article, sorry, the article itself on the publisher's website at the point of publication is, is the version that is being cited. So there's only one, um, which is perhaps an advantage to gold open access. So, so that, that will be the version that people have cited. Um, whereas for green open access, someone may have read the green the the open access version in the repository um, but then will have they may have been directed or they're likely to cite the official journal version of record version so and there's no easy way to tell which version of the paper someone read to be able to have cited that article once that citation is captured so that is a very good question uh, and one which 
is very difficult to answer be just because that behavior is extremely difficult to track. Even if you did know that someone had read the green version, um, you just have to make the assumption that that's what they've cited. That's the reason why they've cited it. Um, again, that question is going to keep me up for an extra hour tonight, dwelling on it, I think. It's a good question. Um, that is the last question in the Q&A session. Um, uh, let me scroll in the chat to see if there's any others. Do you see it? If, if not, I can read it to you. So Zoe is asking, is there a drawback to publishing many articles in one journal versus publishing articles in a variety of different journals? Oh, I, I was speaking about that one. Maybe I was maybe I was rambling too much about various things. I kind of covered that. Sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, Anuja is asking, tell me if you see this. Uh, Anuja is asking, is there an online resource that provides a list of journals that do not charge publication fees? The papers may or may not be open access. Uh, directory of open access journals is the place to look for that. For Luma asks, for English literature, gender studies with Web of Science and Scopus be good sources of good journals. Um, uh, I could briefly mention your, your reference list and your bibliography. That's probably the, the first best place to look. You could use Web of Science and Scopus as well to supplement that and to provide you some additional information about those, those types of journals, or those journals from your reference list. Um, so no, no one of these things individually. I wouldn't rely on any one individually. They all complement each, each other. Um, and then the following question, would these quality criteria be enough for us to judge a journal or does it have to be indexed in Scopus or Web of Science? So that was that was asked at the at the end of when I was going through all of the details of individual journals and what to look for on their websites. Um, uh, yes, effectively, I would say yes, that that is really all those websites look for. One of the key difference between uh, those kind of editorial assessments you could make of a journal and why they're indexed in Scopus or Web of Science has a lot to do with citation profiles and how, how that journal and the editorial board and the authors are fit in with a matrix of citation records and the value and weight that journal has in the field. Um, that's one of the key uh, things that Web of Science and Scopus look at when they're indexing journals to determine the value that it adds to those databases. Um, so, no, it doesn't have to be indexed in, in those databases. You can use your own judgment. Um, hopefully that's a helpful answer to that. Uh, Zainab asked, what's my take of altmetrics? And um, that was before I started speaking about it at length. Um, briefly, I really like it. I love it. There's loads of information there. Um, you can dig around for ages. Janine, is there one specific source where you can find ranking of journals by speci speciality? Um, yes, but Web, Web of Science and um, Scopus, you can sort journals by the subject area and various things. Um, so yeah, hopefully that covers that. Um, uh, Luma again, is peer review timeline in the sciences faster than in the humanities? Uh, yes, quite often, but not always. Um, is a helpful answer to that. There's a website called SciRev, S-C-I-R-E-V, which has a lot of that information in it. Um, they are so that they compile turnaround times from different subject areas and give different benchmarks of turnaround times. And so you know scirev.org, I believe. I think um, that's the, the yeah. So have a look at that website and you can see some sort of subject area 
times to give you a sense of what is standard or common. Um, what are the cues to identify predatory journals? Hopefully I covered that. Perhaps I didn't say it explicitly, um, but all of the sort of criteria and things we've been discussing in this webinar, um, if any of them seem to be lacking or what you're looking for in a journal isn't there or you're not particularly impressed by how the journal presents itself or what you find there, then you, you shouldn't really submit to that journal anyway. So there's no, there's no one, solute, one easy, quick solution that you can say, this is what a predatory journal looks like. Um, it does take a little bit of digging around. Some of them are more obvious than others, um, and others are very successful at deceiving for various reasons, and, you, and it's pretty much as close to you know, a legitimate journal. So it can be, it can be quite tricky, um, which is an unhelpful answer, but no one, no one has a, a really good answer for that. Um, there was a very interesting paper, an article published um, just recently about that, um, which does which does give some quite quite good sort of pointers on how to identify predatory journals. But again, nothing that I haven't covered in this session today. It's variation on the theme of checking for quality and. Um, you know, giving giving some standards to what you want to see from the journal. Um, Luma again, would predatory journals sell our work to others? Um, per, perhaps, uh, although I don't believe, uh, again, someone on Twitter, there, this was a Twitter conversation recently as well, whether this has actually happened. Um, because one thing, lots of, well, one thing the big publishers say about publishing open access and using a CCBY license um, that allows for very open reuse and reselling of research of a paper. They say that people can sell your work and make money from it. Uh, so there was a big discussion on Twitter about whether anyone has ever seen this happen at all, because if it did happen, you should be able to find it, the internet being what it is. So, and no one has, no one who was involved in the conversation anyway had heard about work being taken and sold in a visible way anyway. I mean, there's always an offline print black market perhaps for selling work. So you never know. And it, it, is, it is possible. Um, I mean, predatory journals might sell your work all the traditional legitimate publishers are more likely to do it, to be honest, to repackage content and sell it on in various ways because that is what they, that's what they are good at and designed to do. Are there any more? What is the impact role of LinkedIn and ResearchGate in knowledge dissemination and traditional impact factors? Hopefully I kind of covered that one with alt metrics alternative metrics. Um, do you see any disadvantage in publishing a work in bioarchive prior to submission? Uh, no, none at all. The only reason why you shouldn't submit your work as a preprint before you submit to any journal is in the rare cases when a journal won't allow a submission if a paper has been in a preprint server at all. Um, and there are not very many of those journals. Um, but otherwise, everyone should be posting their work to a preprint server while they are, while you're trying to find a journal, um, while you're like going through everything that I've been speaking about today. While you're doing that, just have them post it to a preprint server, tell people about it, and you can start getting feedback and start getting people to read your work straight away. No, no disadvantages at all. Um, and 
You would be happy to hear my opinion regarding modern open access journals such as eLife. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, open open peer review journals. Um, I mean, eLife, e Embo journals as well, Embo press journals. They both have very interesting peer review system of discussion with reviewers, authors, and editors. It's very transparent. Um, and it's more of a discourse than traditional peer review. Um, and they're all open access, all provide all of the reviews so you can see the whole process. You know, that's fantastic for educating um, younger researchers into what peer review looks like. You can read the whole process. Um, and also for transparency, for the integrity of science. That's very progressive. Um, journal like F1000 as well is excellent. Um, their, their version of transparent peer review process and of public um, peer review at submission stage, post revision stage acceptance is really interesting as well. Um, very personally, the future of journals is more platform based than journal based, I suspect. That is definitely the direction it's headed. So Duncan, thank you, thank you so much for answering all of these questions. Thank you, the audience was fantastic today. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, if there are any additional questions. I'm sorry? I was saying thanks everyone for all those questions, really good questions. Yes, and if there are any additional questions, feel free to uh, follow up with us, send us an email, and we'll make sure we share this with Duncan if necessary, or you can contact him directly at Inago. Um, thank yeah. you, everyone. Yes. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Goodbye. Happy day.